Good evening, and welcome to this special live episode of Wellness Matters. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Bird. On tonight's show, we're gonna be exploring complementary and alternative medicine, integrating standard medicine with CAM practices, and how technology can play a part in helping you make healthy changes in your life. I'm pleased to be joined in the studio tonight by a great panel of experts, Dr. Amy Banter, a family physician at Riverview Medical Group in Noblesville, Indiana, and the medical director of Shamrock Wellness, a virtual wellness model, Opt to Live. Dr. Jeff Glad. Dr. Glad runs Glad MD Integrative Medicine, Mitovan.com, the web's only online nutrient depletion calculator, and also serves as chief medical officer for Fullscript. Dr. John Peterson, a board certified family physician practicing in Muncie, he was one of the first traditional Western family physicians to incorporate the principles of Maharishi Ayurveda healthcare into his practice in 1984. And Dr. Steve Windley, a specialist in family practice with advanced training in integrative medicine, and he's the medical director of integrative medicine at Schneck Medical Center in Seymour, Indiana. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Now, before we get started, I wanna remind all of our viewers that this is a live show and we will be taking questions from you. If you have questions for our panel, you can call 1-800-252-9472 or send us an email at wipb at bsu.edu. We're also streaming live on wipb.org and on Facebook Live, so you can also send us a question on those platforms as well. And we're really excited to hear from you, so uh, please feel free to uh, send us a question at any time during the show. Make them short. Yeah. <laughs> and to the point. <laughs> I, uh, I'm joined by not just a panel of experts, but also some great personal friends. So I appreciate each of you taking time out of your busy lives to come and help inform our viewers tonight about your individual roles, maybe uh, what got you interested in complementary uh, and integrative medicine, and uh, talk about your areas of expertise and hopefully ask some questions for, uh, for, from, our, uh, from our viewers. I, I always like to start with particularly for you two, since you trained at Ball Hospital in family medicine, was there ever a special person there that you, you really thought made a difference in your, in your medical training? Had to be Jeff Bird, right? right. Well, wow. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine. Well, thank you guys so much. That, Based uh, on what you told us before the show to say, I, yeah, yeah, you know that. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Amy, uh, let's start with you. Tell us okay. a little bit about your practice and how you incorporate uh, some of these less than traditional medical practices into what it is that you do. Um, well, I, I, I really have a pretty traditional family medicine practice, um, have had since I was here in Muncie for mm -hmm. what, almost 12 years, yeah. and I've been in Noblesville another 12 years. Um, but like many of you, I went into family medicine uh, with the goal that I really like helping people find ways of being healthy, preventing disease, and um, that's not always the case when people walk into your door, they're not all healthy and they do come in with disease. And, um, but I realized I didn't really wanna just be um, focusing on a pill for every ill and I really wanted to help inform and educate. The word doctor means to teach and I feel like that's our job as physicians. And so practicing here in Muncie, uh, taught at the residency for, like I said, nine years, I guess, mm -hmm. and then um, went on to go into a practice in Noblesville and then I also opened a physical wellness center with my husband mm -hmm. Eric and we had yoga, massage, a um, lot of wellness seminars just trying to educate people on what they can do in their own health or in their own lifestyle to promote health and maybe to reverse some disease that was brewing in their in their bodies and uh, we now have actually it's a virtual wellness center um, the model has well I have these four pillars that I decided we would make it easy to remember because it's things that we do every single day we get up we breathe eat move sleep um, and really just trying to help people understand that 
you have so much control with your lifestyle choices that you're making every single day, whether it's you know choosing to be stressed or not and how we're gonna manage stress through the breathe pillar, um, mindfulness, breathing, meditation, yoga, um, how, what we choose to put in our body because food is medicine. So a lot of what I do is using food and nutrition and helping educate people, helping them sift through all the different diet plans. And the, it, there's a lot of confusion and just a lot of advice out there. And then movement and the importance of sleep. And so a lot of it is, in my practice, a lot of it is lifestyle choices and then also just helping guide people on supplements. And then even when they're wanting to do more integrative medicine, referring them on to people that are doing things such as yourselves because we weren't taught a lot of this in medical school and um, I think a lot of physicians um, just have to learn this on their own and go get their own advanced training so just trying to be an advocate for patients when they're ready. Yeah thank you. Dr. Glad how about you? Well I, so I mean going back to, to, to my story which is so key to kind of what what we do now but I mean I you know, never took advantage of, I mean, Steve was doing acupuncture in residency, which was right. crazy. And, and John was right down the road from, from the practice. But my, my walk was very conventional medical school residency, go, go see 40 patients a day in practice, deliver babies, um, and got caught up in that and way too many drug rep lunches that started in, in, here in Muncie in the residency and was overweight, uh, was self-medicating myself for panic attacks that I had since medical school and decided after my second child, I, I, just, I just needed to eat better. Started eating more cleanly, not sure exactly what that meant, but kind of took steps I thought were, were necessary. Lost 50 pounds in six months, got off a of medication, and just could never look at patients the same way. Um, and it was in that busy practice still, and, and now I, I can't write insulin anymore. I can't write the third blood pressure medicine. I, I gotta ask you what you ate this morning. Yeah. I, let, let, let's talk about that. And what I found was, you know, 80% of people just wanted the med. They just want to go home with the script and just take care of it. But 20% of people wanted, I'm excited, they lit up, and I got to go because I got three more people in other rooms. Yeah. And so to, to me, it was the broken model that, that really sort of led me to go study more about how to help people in this discipline, but then also how to build a practice that, that allowed this to happen because a seven-minute office visit doesn't get the job done, mm -hmm. especially when a lot of these patients are hurting and they're suffering and they're sick and they need somebody to listen. So, I, you know, I started an integrated practice with the hospital up north and then after a year kind of refined the model and just went out on my own. Um, we don't deal with insurance. And that way I have an hour, uh, you know, for every patient. Mm -hmm. Spend a lot of time, dig deep, also did the studying that, that, that Amy said is so necessary that we don't get. Um, in traditional conventional practice. So functional medicine, integrative medicine, how do you get to the root of someone's issues? Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about some of those sure, disciplines sure, we'll, yeah. and, and, and topics, but have now run this practice for nine years. My, my wife Neely's a nurse practitioner, she's with me. Um, and people come to see us and, and it's, a, it's a really nice mix of the sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. You know, help me break this down and figure out what this is and you get all the way down to the roots of, of, of the body and what's happening but also now seeing a ton of people who are saying either I'm really healthy or I think I am and I want to stay that way and my doctor doesn't have time or, or know how to carry that conversation. Help me figure that out. Let's, let's do some blood work. And, um, but also the I, I'm not quite healthy. I, I'm not really sick, but I also just don't have a good relationship with my doctor anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't have time for me. They retired. They moved on. And I just want somebody who, who has a medical background who will spend time with me. Um, and again, the, unfortunately, the, the model of healthcare that we have can't, can't pay for that. And so um, that, that's, you know, that, that's what we've been able to do and, and enjoyed this little boutique practice that allows us to connect with people who, who need it. That's great. John, dare I call you the grandfather of this? <laughs> you, uh, you, you know, I think back to my time in the residency you know, in the, in the mid 80s, and you were already out there blazing a trail. Uh, tell me, tell our viewers, what got you interested in all of this, and how did you, how did you get to <laughs> practicing medicine the way that you have done so successfully? Really, what, for the last four years? Successfully is always a good question. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, it goes back a while. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I was uh, a, a progressive kind of student in the 60s and uh, a rock and roll musician, basically, and got interested in herbal medicine. My father was an organic chemistry professor, and so I got into that and uh, then started medical school in 1970 and from the get-go realized that there were huge gaps in what I was studying. I thought, you know, we should be able to fill in some of this in some way. So my wife was a molecular geneticist and she got interested in transcendental meditation and in those days became a teacher of transcendental meditation, studied with Maharishi Mahashogi and some of the great Vedic scholars of, of that day. And then Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine and some of these Eastern approaches came up and we had uh, the, the great opportunity. I look back on it with such appreciation now. Uh, the great opportunity to actually sit down with Maharishi and the masters of Ayurveda and the Vedic tradition, the great Vaijas of India who were the deans of the medical schools. And when Maharishi sent them to um, all the different continents. When they came to the United States, because of our legal system, there had to be a licensed doctor from the United States to sit in with them. So there was a group of us doctors, uh, me and John Duliard, Deepak Chopra, these were all my fellow students, and we uh, sat in with the masters. And through an apprenticeship, uh, every time they'd come to the Midwest, I would sit in with them, study with 30 or 40 of them, didn't even know who they were until 20 years later they say oh you studied with Traguna you know <laughs> you did <laughs> you know and, and it was just an incredibly beautiful experience and they really helped me fill in some gaps and then my wife and I started an Ayurveda consultation center we've had since the early 1980s and we've seen people from as far away as Brazil Iceland Japan um, they all come to Muncie. Mm -hmm. um, and then Maharishi at one point in the early 1980s said, please incorporate these things into your medical practice, including Ayurvedic pulse diagnosis, which is so fun. I mean, it just makes the whole thing fun. In 10 seconds, you have a whole view of a patient that you could otherwise not have. And so that's what I did. I went, who's gonna say no to Maharishi, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. That's what I've been, been doing for since the early 1980s so it's yeah. been a blast and uh, now that I'm in my 70s I just am at a level of appreciation for all of my mentors and my friends yeah. Yeah. and my cohorts well, I mean, it's, I'm in appreciation phase of life yeah yeah right. we'll, uh, yeah. well and we'll certainly dig a little bit deeper to into that uh, as we progress through the hour Dr. Windley tell us your story so the the story for me started uh, approaching medical school my dad brings home this tape that's he says it's about nutrition you're going to medical school take a listen to this and and on the tape the the guy's talking about health care for humans and health care for animals and he says you know a farmer can't afford a ten thousand dedu dollar deductible for a hundred head of cattle you know we, they do a lot more to keep animals healthy than what people are doing to keep themselves healthy nutritionally and that Having two grandparents who are farmers, that really kind of stuck with me a little bit. And um, then a week before medical school, my buddy says, hey, we've got to go see this herbalist. He's, he's an Amish guy, and he's, he's way out in the country, but he's very good with herbs. And I sat with him for two or three hours, and we just talked about food and nutrition. And, and really, um, <laughs> being, being an Amish guy out in the country with no phone, no TV, he was pretty knowledgeable on where the healthcare system was at. And, and some of the uh, downfalls of it. And it, it just completely flipped my mentality and mindset heading into medical school. And with Solomon. Uh, Solomon and, and, his, and, his, and his nephew, yeah. Jake. And, uh, and so that started the journey. And then along with that, some of my own health issues, which brings a lot of us to mm -hmm. additional, like, like with Jeff, uh, you know, exploring things to get myself at a healthier place and, and working on the, the allergies that I had. And, uh, helping with with focus so I didn't have to do medical school twice and and uh, <laughs> moving forward that way and and once you start you know you start learning about nutrition you start learning of of how uh, our diet is like and it just starts to snowball with the vitamins and herbal therapies and acupuncture and 
um, I remember applying for residency, and, and prior to coming to Muncie, I, I talked with another program, and, and I said, you know, I'm very interested in nutrition and alternative medicine, and got a very clear, you won't be doing that here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, good to know, and I remember uh, uh, talking with you guys here and uh, being very open, and Amy saying, yeah, we've, we've got an alternative medicine grant here, and, and uh, I went home and, and told my wife, I, I, I think I know where I'm going. Pack this your bags, we're yeah. in the Muncie. Yeah. We're in now. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and then the, the, it just the, the momentum kept going from there and doing acupuncture in the clinic and then finding a place. And I'm in Seymour, and, and the hospital said, hey, we, we don't really understand it. We aren't, we aren't fully uh, aware of it, but we know people want it. We need somebody to do it and, and do it mm -hmm. and bring it in to our traditional realm so that we can have it done in a safe and effective mm -hmm. and, and knowledgeable manner. And, and, um, and, and like you mentioned, patients really drive this because they, they really are looking for additional help and additional thoughts and, and additional perspectives. And, and, and they do drive from drive, fly, what have you, long distances just to get that information. So yeah. I think you should never get to the point where you're, you tell a patient, there's nothing more that you can do. Right, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. Uh, that, that really is the thing. I know when we were uh, prepping for the show, one of the terms that is uh, may maybe has been a little more popular the last few years is this term functional medicine. So who, who, who wants to grab, grab an attempt at a definition, what that means, what a viewer should know about functional medicine? Yeah, I, it's actually, it's a big debate and there's way too many separate training programs and disciplines and everybody's trying to grab education. That's what we do as education. Docs, you fit it into Yeah, this, for sure. It's got all, everybody's got to have their own silo. Um, so, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the general term would be integrative medicine. That, that's the broader term that sort of came from Dr. Andrew Weil and the University of Arizona, which is where I trained. Um, and, I mean, it's all integrative because you're integrating the best of alternative and complementary and functional with conventional. The, the functional group would, would be more kind of tied into the biochemistry and, and the genetics and sort of the, the really deep scientific interactions of the body. M most integrative docs and providers also do some functional training. So there's way more similarities than there are differences, but, but most of the functional would, would be more of that biochemical, scientific, wh while still paying a lot of attention to stress being the root and mm -hmm. poor sleep and nutrition. So th those foundation pieces are the same no matter what. Yeah. I think, uh, I think maybe a place to start the conversation as we get into a little more of the detail for tonight's program would be, uh, I think back, I like to brag that I'm part Native American, right? And I think back to the concept of the medicine man. I think back to the concept of how many of our traditional medications, the pharmaceutical industry, are based on naturally occurring compounds and plants. I think back, Amy, to talking to your sister mm -hmm. who had done some incredible research out in California around Tibetan medicine and, mm -hmm. and traditional Indian and, and Eastern medicine. You know, before there was medical school, there was medicine being practiced. And I think part of what we're doing these days is getting back to a more traditional way to look at keeping ourselves healthy and even treating some of the common ailments that, mm -hmm. that our viewers are, are suffering from. So to, let, let's, let's start there and run with that. that. You know, that's, why, that's why in medical school I started looking at ancient systems of medicine, ancient systems of natural medicine, because at least you had information that has withstood the test of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there isn't much in modern medicine that has withstood the test of time. And even with you guys, we, you know, in practice half the time that I have, you've seen standards shift yeah. to just the opposite of what they were. And huh. at least with the ancient systems, you know they're not going to be around if they didn't work. So, so I mean, that's, that was one of the keys for me. I started looking at all of them, including Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese and, yeah. And, and some of the, the great herbalists 
uh, from all these traditions have now combined forces and gone all the different continents and have now looked at all of the various you know, doshic balances and this kind of thing for all the plants throughout, throughout the world, which is an incredible thing right now. Yeah. But and, and all of those traditional practices also weave in nutrition mm -hmm. and breathing and mindfulness and community and relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and so n not only did we sort of extract the herb and turn it into a pharmaceutical, but we also created a system that largely only allows for the prescription of the pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. right? The there's no time for the, for the other pieces. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so much of what I love doing is just getting back to the roots of relationship and, and, you know, and, and that type of true care. Um, I'm also big on the placebo effect, uh, which, which is a huge thing and, and belief um, in, in what you're doing. You know, and you, so you take supplements and herbs that, that have research and usually get, you know, by conventional physicians, just sort of the, the, can, the, the can term is, well, there's, there's not enough evidence. Well, there, there's, there's plenty of evidence. There's also very little downside to most of these things. And so, you know, to, 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 to also use the placebo effect using things that have very little downside to, to try alongside of lifestyle pieces. I mean, it's really, it, it, it's the way healthcare needs to come back toward. You know, and I think a lot of the, you were talking about the traditional plants and all that, and then they've actually figured out like digitalis, right? Digoxin's a medication, it's from a plant. Um, so there are all these supplements, that, but also if we just look at food in general and our diet, and if we can have more of a plant-based diet, which um, I think we all agree is like the core root of, there are things called phytonutrients, plant-based nutrients, which are basically these medicines in all these foods that we eat. And, if, and that's kind of the biggest thing that I enjoy doing is helping people just be aware of how much power and how much healing can go on just from their diet and what they're eating. It really, it really is. reminding the individual that, hey, lifestyle matters. Mm -hmm. You know, let's empower your lifestyle along with what other treatment you're doing. And, and I, I know coming through medical school, it was your traditional, or if you're not, you're you're out there and you're 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 crazy. You're out there with Dr. Peterson, and you don't want to be out there, and yeah. you better come back this way. And yeah. and <laughs> it, it's starting to not only just there, there's there's research on the integrative side, but it's it, the goal is to bring them both. You know, to make to make it not integrative. It's just medicine yeah. is right. ultimately the goal, and and utilizing whatever is best and utilizing Ayurvedic medicine, utilizing um, you know, acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, part of the whole scope of, of what we're gonna do. Steve, I, uh, I recall conversations that you and I have had talking about uh, not just the foods that we put in our body and what tremendous effect those can have, but uh, the concept of periodic fasting. T talk a little bit about the effect on the body of, of uh, short fasts. So, so the concept of fasting obviously dates back to the Bible and before, and I remember hearing 40 days and 40 nights, and I, I never thought that was that pleasant a topic, but the, the medicinal side of fasting has really taken off with people understanding uh, not only weight loss, which can be very helpful for some, but decreasing inflammation in the body, helping with hormone balance. Wonderful for diabetics mm -hmm. to at least learn the concept and start to uh, tiptoe into that. And uh, wh what I so much like about fasting is the fact that it's available to anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no prescription pad, there's no uh, cost limitations, and it can be so simple. It's, I, I tell patients, we're going to talk about changing the timing of your meals. This is not a starvation uh, situation here. We're just going to explore when you eat, extend the fasting time that we all have, usually at night while we're sleeping, and allow your body to make some changes to hit a reset button while it's doing that. What, uh, what do you usually counsel your patients about that? So, well, I'll, I'll say, what is, what is your typical fasting time? When, when is your last food or non-water drink of the day? When does it start the next morning? And whatever it is, let's say it's 11 hours, 12 hours, let's try to take it a little bit longer. Let's try to take it, uh, you know, to 13 to 14, maybe move up to 15, 16 hours. We call that intermittent fasting. There, there are a variety of fasting uh, 
uh, options. Some people do a day at a time or work up to a five-day schedule. For most of my patients, they're just starting with this idea. And so we, we start very simply with the intermittent fasting of just what's your normal and can we space it out a little bit? Yeah. I want to uh, take this opportunity to remind our viewers that we are on uh, live TV tonight. So we're looking forward to taking your questions. You can call us at 1-800-252-9472 or email us at wipb at bsu.edu. If you're watching online or on Facebook or wipb.org, you can send us a message on those platforms as well. Um, well the fasting part is yeah. it, ayurvedically that's that's a, an interesting angle there too i mean it's fasting is you know considered a great purification right. um way of getting rid of impurities we call it ama the products of unripe digestion of food and experience that they, they clog the channels the shrotas and but and fasting is is interesting in in the vedic sense in that it's body type specific. Right. In other words, you may have heard of this vata type space and error. Those people can't fast so well. So maybe a 24 hour fast would be fine. Whereas a fitter person like Jeff with more fire and everything, they can handle a little bit longer. Oh, I got to fast longer than a day, Jeff, <laughs> is that what you're telling me? All right. But the, those with the kapha, you know, uh, water and earth, the bigger people with the endurance and everything, they can fast. They can do 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 days with just water. So, so it's, it can be individualized just extremely beautifully on that, and it's really potent. I agree, Thanks, Steve. Oh, I'm one of the most important interventions. Yeah. I had an 80-year-old lady who decided to start doing this and got off of her insulin. Like she, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. She's diabetic, obviously, yeah. but, I mean, she did it medically supervised. She came and asked me about it, and we worked through it, and she did the... 16-8. So the yeah. shots we were given got overcome by what the body was naturally able mm -hmm. to do when That'd we used, used our own healing power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I know the viewers are going to want to know a little bit about uh, herbs and supplements and those types of things. Do you, do you have opinions around that? <laughs> of course we do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear them, John. <laughs> Well, in in the Vedic tradition, these ancient tr traditions, the you know, Ayurvedic pharmacology and herbology is huge. You know, textbooks after textbooks, and now the masters of medicinal plants have gone to all the continents and worked with all the herbalists. So we have this huge uh, storehouse of knowledge now on, on herbal medicine. But the ones that are most interesting to me are something called Rasayanas, which are uh, these combination of herbs that have been passed down for five to six thousand years from one generation to the next to the next to the next and there are various <coughs> combination of herbs that you know are picked according to the light of the full moon and mm -hmm. <laughs> with with various ceremonies and things like that and 40 pounds that are concentrated into a paste and they're called rasayanas. And if you read the ancient textbook, it said when you take a rasayana, it allows the cells to vibrate in bliss. So they've actually studied some of the rasayanas, Amr Amrit Kalash at Ohio State and IU and Stanford and Southern Cal. And they've now shown an extremely potent antioxidant. Um, and with rabbits who have uh, who are taking Amrit Kalash, if you inject a carcinogen, you can't really induce the cancer. So, it, so it's, it's one of those ancient kind of things that now Western medicine is starting to look at a little bit. You can actually research on, so it's. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously this, this practice of medicine relies heavily on herbs and vitamins and supplements. Um, but there, there are some big downsides to that too. I mean, so, some practitioners rely, you know, sort of over rely on that, right? And patients get kind of sucked into the vortex of one after another after another. I mean, I, you know, have all kinds of horror stories of patients I go grab in the lobby have two carry on suitcases full of their supplements. Like, all right, this is not, yeah. like, I I'm only going to thin this list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, patients have to be really cautious too about okay, why, why am I taking this? What, what, what are my goals here? Because, you know, there's capsule fatigue of taking way too many things. There's the cost of all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then the other big factor that we're wrestling with is th this is a largely unregulated 
beast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, new supplement companies are popping up right and left and CBD oil is being sold at the family video. And it's mm -hmm. just, I mean, there's a lot of dangerous stuff in there, you know, and, and so patients who are interested in supplementation should, should, should try to find authorities. And sometimes those authorities can come online. Um, ideally, it's practitioners. There aren't enough of them yet. Mm -hmm. um, but, but working with practitioners who know what they're doing is the safest thing and, and not just walking into the drugstore to buy this stuff. I mean, so many studies of what, what you get from these drugstores is, is not what's on the label. And now we're seeing, because I, I work in the industry of the, of the, you know, the pharmaceutical grade supplements, you can go online on Amazon and, and buy the pharmaceutical grade company stuff that's being sold at the doctor's office, but that's not what it is. Like they're printing the labels and they're buying the bottles to look like replicas. It's it's not it's not what you think you're taking. What's so in there's not the same uh, it's just the whole thing is is really really frustrating as as a practitioner, um, because not everybody can see a you know yeah. a, an integrative doc and get that advice, yeah. and so they're trying to do it on their own, and that's a that, that's a dangerous journey sometimes. Yeah, and there's toxicities that can go along with these supplements and herbs and things too, and. Um, I think they're a supplement to your lifestyle and to the things right. that we've all been talking about that are so important. So that's the other thing is I think remembering the word, but they are supplements. It, it's good to have a, an advisor, a coach, a doctor mm -hmm. who's who can say, hey, this makes sense, this doesn't. Everything, whether it's a medicine, a supplement, what have you, needs to have a job. It needs to be performing something that is of benefit. And um, and, and like Jeff said, it, I mean, there's there's just too many choices <clears throat> out there, some of which may not be right for the individual. It's, it's just good to have some expertise to help. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very pleased. We've got our first question. Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, a viewer writes in, what should I look for if I want to find a doctor who practices or integrates complementary, complementary medicine in their treatment? Yeah, boy, there's a lot of resources for that as well. Um, I mean, most of our patients come by word of mouth. So pe people talking about what we do and, 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 and how we approach healthcare. You know, all of these different educating bodies, uh, Institute for Functional Medicine, IFM, the University of Arizona, all have lists of doctors who are, you know, practitioners where they can search their area. So that, that's one way to start. Um, unfortunately, it's the wild west in the way these doctors mm -hmm. practice, these other providers practice. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you can read their website, if you can, you know, you know friends or family members that have seen these doctors, it's, it's, it's better to get that sort of experience to, to, to make sure it's a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, but I would start w with an online search of your local area using some of these kind of tried and true education programs. A lot more hospitals bringing integrative medicine clinics to the public, which are usually insurance-based, which is a big, big deal for, you know, the, the population who isn't necessarily going to be able to f afford out-of-pocket care. Mm -hmm. So those are, th that's a good start, too, to plug into this type of care. Yeah. Explore, yeah. explore their website. If you have a practitioner in mind, even call the office and why are you going there? Is, the, is there a condition you want to treat and do they treat that condition and, and maybe how do they do that? Uh, and like Jeff said, word of mouth, really, especially with Facebook and so on, that's honestly where a lot of our patients come from. Yeah, mm -hmm. I we think it's important that, that um, practitioners who are using alternative methods keep up with their traditional allopathic Western approach too so that they won't miss anything. Uh, I mean, it's been important for me to keep up my board certification. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so if, if something comes up in I'm not going to be totally at a loss with some weird medical problem. Uh, and once they understand, yeah, I know what that is, and that, yes, your, other, your doctors are doing a good job for you, yeah. then you can uh, say this, this might work or that you, can, you might be able to add this or uh, you know, a meditation program would be especially good or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have another question. When speaking of the placebo effect, how does the outlook of med meditation, yeah, meditation with placebo effect work together psychologically? So placebo effect, meditation, other things, how, how, does, that, how does that all <laughs> work together? <laughs> well, I'm very interested in meditation techniques. I mean, I've been practicing twice a day for the last 50 years. Um, and I don't know what it is. I'll call it placebo, but, but if, 
if, if, if the technique is such that it allows the mind to go beyond thinking and beyond feeling and beyond um, the unnecessary thinking <laughs> that happens for most of us, it allows us to experience that silence I'm not sure what to, I'm not sure I'd call that placebo. Well, <laughs> let, let, let's uh, let me interject here. Okay. <laughs> placebo. Think about this now. We who went to traditional medical school, you get taught that the the placebo is some horrific thing, mm. right? It can It doesn't. I love placebo. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Right. We so, all love which is Arms, which is yeah. the point, truly, yeah. isn't it? That yeah. in a double-blind, randomized, crossover medical study, if there's a placebo effect, that's a bad thing in traditional medicine. When indeed, I think what we would all say is, bring on the placebo. Right. right. We'll take bring it. Bring it on. That, that yeah. and, and and there's also now the nocebo effect, yeah. right? I, I I believe I'm going to have side effects of this chemotherapy regimen or radiation, yeah. so mm -hmm. I don't want it, or, or this statin drug when I actually, you know, would probably benefit from it. But I mean, I, I think ultimately what we're talking about is is this this power of belief and hope, and there's there's very I mean I don't think there's any better way to sort of flex and strengthen the the the, the mind body muscle than than using meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and what most people think of as meditation is why well, I, I just I tried. Yeah. I, I sat there for thirty minutes and I, I just my mind wandered and you know it's kind of the idea yeah. like 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 letting that mind wander and kind of mm -hmm. letting it go. Um, but you know we, we we talked in sort of the the, the debriefing and in topics, but tech has really brought guided meditation to your pocket. So the apps that we'll typically recommend people start with is either Headspace or Calm or 10% Happier. These are really great ways to get an introduction to what's possible in just letting that mind kind of roll and focus and, and connect. And so I heard it best, the guy who started 10% Happier said, um, you know, because he was getting frustrated when he started meditation. Like, I'm just, I'm not doing it right. This isn't working. And he said, you don't do meditation to make it work the 10 minutes you're doing it. You do meditation to make it work the 23 hours and 50 minutes you're not. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. yeah. right. And so any way to create that, you know, as you might call it, pressing pause in the day mm -hmm. is, 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 is powerful. Mm -hmm. It has to be a technique that allows the mind to go where it really wants to go which is to take a break from all of those unnecessary thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so if it has, if so it's a technique that involves thinking, even positive thinking, that isn't going to get there. <laughs> it has to be a technique that actually goes beyond that to experience the silence, because the silence is really the source of healing in our physiology. Yoga. Yoga. What do you think? Your hubby. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our whole family's 200 hour trained yogis, actually. My husband's 500 hour. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think yoga is what really um, is the root of our wellness center model and our coaching model that we're doing now with Opt to Live. Um, yoga, most of yoga is meditation, breath, mindfulness. Um, then there's the movement part, which I think. In, here in the United States, a lot of people think that is what yoga is, but yoga is that connection of your body, your mind, um, going inward, finding a way to physically get your body connected to your mind, and then you do get into these states of meditation. Um, and it's interesting because back to this whole placebo, meditation, yoga, all this stuff, I mean, it, it's hard to study things that you can't see and measure but they are starting to look at it and even seeing that when people that meditate or people that do yoga, they physiologically have changes in their immune cells, in their blood pressure, in their heart rate, in um, lowering their risk of cancer recurrences. So we know that integrating these things, the yoga, the yeah. meditation, mindfulness helps. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just chuckling under my breath because I would think of myself personally, right? So. John, when you had done my pulse diagnosis before, I, I came up, you used the word fire. So when I think of yoga, what I think of is hot box yoga where I can work up the most horrible <laughs> sweat imaginable by me, you know, rather than right. being contemplative right. about what it is that I'm trying to do and finding a little free space in my mind. So uh, yeah, not always the best way.
the, the, the father of, of yoga, Patanjali, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, mm -hmm. he says that yoga really is the quieting of the mind. Mm -hmm. And those limbs of yoga then are just a part of it, you know, the asanas <laughs> and the breathing and everything right. else. Cool. And, yeah. and, but, but it's the quieting of the mind, which is actually the centerpiece of yoga. Yeah. It means unity. Yeah. We, uh, we have our third question. And uh, I anticipated we would get to something specific like this. Uh, question three, I was diagnosed in August with AFib. And it uh, appears that uh, the, qu the viewer was placed on uh, diltiazem, a traditional pharmacologic medicine, and Eliquist, a blood thinning medication. And uh, I think the question would be, are there herbal medications that could be used instead? The, the big one that I tell all new AFib patients are, please get a sleep study. Please make sure that, that sleep apnea is not part of the picture. And, and I mean, I have maybe not the broadest AFib population, but in the people who come see me, it's 100%. It's, mm -hmm. If not, it's really close. Um, no matter how big or small they are, or age, what have you, uh, I think, uh, especially in females, sleep apnea is one of the most underdiagnosed, underappreciated conditions there is. So that would be, mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily alternative, but it, it's very prevalent in that, that group. Well, I think this gets back to what John was saying too. I mean, th th there are conventional medicines when you have a condition that we don't have any better evidence mm -hmm. to prevent that. I mean, well, you're, you're taking a blood thinner to prevent that blood clot from forming in the heart mm -hmm. and, and then going, yep out into the body. Yeah. I wouldn't rely on an herb to yeah, switch right, out right. from a blood thinner. Yeah. So, you know, again, like it's it, the, 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 way to, the, the way to approach that is, okay, is there, a, is there a root issue to that that we really need to get to? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to get you off the medicine, but guess what? The medicine is, is only protecting you against the catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. Whatever got you to AFib, if it's sleep apnea, that's gonna manifest in other ways down the road. Let, let's, let's dig into that. Yeah. Now, I, li I like uh, the meds, prescription meds for AFib. Right. I, I think they're great yeah. um, yeah. if they're dosed right and, mm -hmm. and all that. But I, every now and then I have patients who come in, usually from Chicago or someplace, they say, I am not going to be taking that. And so there actually are some Ayurvedic Rasayanas specifically for atrial fib mm -hmm. that have Arjuna, which is the archer and all that. that it actually does help uh, enormously. But I always uh, tell people that that's, that that's probably second best. Mm -hmm. it, it makes me beg the question of the people that you allude to that come in with two travel bags full of herbs and supplements they're taking. Many of those people, and I'm sure you see them every day, uh, have, have pharmaceutical prescriptions for things that they go to the drugstore and the doctor writes them a script and they pick them up and there are some interactions between supplements and over-the-counter medications and prescription medications that can be very important. So I, I know I always used to tell my patients, please tell me, if you're taking something over-the-counter, that's great, let's talk about it, but I wanna be sure that there's not, not an, uh, uh, a bad opportunity for an interaction that we would rather not happen. How do you, how do you handle that in your practices? Especially with blood thinners, because right, right. a keys, lot right. of herbs. If you do yeah. have AFib, and yeah. yes, mm -hmm. like a lot, a lot of them, garlic, ginger, all the genes, think, all right. the genes. Yeah. Yes, they can thin your blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're doing a better job there too in in, in the EMRs and using the technology to be able to kind of catch some of those things. But but again, if if a doctor doesn't ask what supplements you're taking and and on our end of things, what medications you're taking, mm -hmm. that, that you don't know. Yeah. Those tools are also available to patients online, so you, you know they can go in and, and, and do those searches. At least, you know, again, because the healthcare system is busy and doesn't have the time that maybe it used to, patients have to become their best advocate, yeah. and patients have to get more involved in their healthcare. They they just have to, yeah. um, and and using you know quality technology from reputable places is is really important there. That's great. Um, we have another question, and it's going to tee us up perfectly for where I want to go with you, Doctor. What's Wendell? the record? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this might be a new okay, record. Okay, got it. Good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, the next question. I have two pinched nerves, four herniated discs, 
and many allergies. I react to epidural injections and I can't take opiate pain medicine. What route should I take to help alleviate some of my pain? And one specific answer I want here, Dr. Wendley, is let's use this to talk a little bit about acupuncture, but let's open the, the question up for general and then um, get to the acupuncture. So first of all, God bless you. And <laughs> secondly, there's still a lot of tools left, acupuncture being one that, that uh, you know, like we've talked about, has been around for millennia and, and can be quite effective for people, especially for the herniated discs, even the allergies, uh, especially when people are struggling. I like to use acupuncture or some other energy techniques when they struggle to take anything orally and they're reacting to uh, things that enter the gut. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, uh, like, like doing the yoga and doing mechanical techniques, um, such as massage or another technique called cranial sacral therapy, maybe one of my new favorites of, of all, uh, all treatments, as well as the nutritional things that can decrease inflammation. And, and again, uh, don't forget what you're eating. You know, if, if you're eating a lot of sugar, uh, you're going to have more inflammation. You're going to be more achy. Um, a gluten for some people, it's not for everybody, but for a lot of my patients, that's an arthritis trigger. Uh, so, so covering the gamut in several categories can give you some leverage to, to get some pain-free life back. I, I, think, I think something that never gets talked about is there's a huge disconnect between what you see radiographically and the way someone actually feels. I mean, there's all kinds of examples of herniated discs, and you, you do MRIs on 21-year-olds, and they all have arthritis in, in, in the spine, too. Mm -hmm. They don't have any pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, assuming that it's actually the pinched nerve that's doing all this damage is, is it may be. Mm -hmm. But like Steve's saying, stepping back and talking about inflammation, maybe investigating, measuring inflammation. You know, is, is there a better diet for this person? Is there, you know, does meditation help? Is there, you know, there's plenty of anti-inflammatory herbal options too. But I, but I think instead of zoning in on th th these are the issues, let, let's step back and say that pain, inflammation, mm -hmm. let, let's address this mm -hmm. in a much bigger way. Much bigger way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, lo I love cranial sacral therapy too. And yeah, I, 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 yeah. Up ledger trained three and four. I mean, they're really highly trained mm -hmm. uh, up ledger folks or cranial sacral therapists are incredible. I've seen those discs pop back in and without mm -hmm. surgery. But Ayurvedically, it's, it's interesting with low back. The, the low back pain, actually, the low back is the seed of fear. And so there's this whole emotional side of it that has to do with fear and protecting the heart. So when you go like this, then because your, your back, it's actually you're protecting. So addressing kind of that emotional side of it, which is almost always there. It's beautiful. Um, during the day, I take two to three short naps and wake up feeling great. Are these naps the same as meditation? No, 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 there, there's when, when the uh, physiologists have looked at this really closely uh, for those who are practicing samadhi meditation, which is meaning that you transcend or go beyond thinking and feeling. That means you're also going beyond dreaming. And um, so physiologically, it's uh, meditation is actually a much deeper level than sleep is. Uh, and a lot of really interesting um, studies on that through the years. In fact, th that's the reason I got started in regular transcendental meditation in 1971. There was a big study that came out in science by Keith Wallace that showed this huge difference between me uh, samadhi meditation and sleep. <laughs> and just broke it through and I, so I told Vicki, I think I'll join you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She was meditating for a while. Yeah. She grabbed me. <laughs> I said, I don't want to learn this. You know, it's too weird, right? Yeah, yeah here I am 50 years later. <laughs> 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 meditating twice a day forever. We, we've alluded to sleep several times, though. So um, feeling better out after a nap is a good thing. Yes. Good thing. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a good yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Might not be exactly like meditation, but it's a good thing. Let's, mm -hmm. let's spend a couple minutes talking about sleep. We put sleep as one of our four, pillars. Of our four pillars. It is. And um, I mean, there's a lot of research out there too little and too much sleep, right? There's kind of this little sweet spot, seven to nine hours, it sounds like. 
Um, and I think we're all a little different in there, but even down to the cellular level, if you look at our chromosomes and something on the little protective tips called the telomeres, and um, we know that getting good sleep helps keep those lengthened. If we are not getting enough sleep, we actually can see shortening of those telomeres, which equates to shorter cell life, shorter lifespan, short, you know, more risk for disease, um, ill effects of that. So. Uh, sleep is very important and I think we, quality sleep is the other thing and I know you like to talk about apps a lot but that's something else I encourage people to do is to monitor or use something to find out how much sleep you're getting and the quality of sleep that you're getting. Yeah, I mean that's a, it's, it's a big category and it's, it's sometimes it's really easy to address with patients and sometimes it's, it's really difficult. I, I try to break it down into do, do we have an issue falling asleep or do we have an issue staying asleep? And sometimes it's a combination of both. Um, but, y you know, it gets back into diet and, and, and other roots of inflammation. It, it may be as easy, you know, hormone replacement for some women or herbal hormone support um, can be valuable. But, but a lot of it is, you know, the, the classic just sleep hygiene, right? We, we spend way too long on screens leading right up to bedtime. We, we know that blue light is toxic for melatonin, which is the key hormone for sleep. And so if we just, you know, if, if most people just practiced much better sleep hygiene, we, we probably solve a lot of sleep issues. But, but it's, you know, it starts with, it's a pillar. Like most people just don't know that. Like it, knowing it's a pillar allows you to invest in ways of, of trying to figure out how to improve it. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, the, the apps are good just to kind of highlight how good or bad is my sleep. Um, my favorite one there is the Aura Ring. Um, and so the Aura Ring, you know, measures quality sleep, measures restfulness, measures readiness to take on the next day from an exercise standpoint, REM sleep. I mean, it's, it's really great just to help track. Working with the right provider can kind of help you figure out, okay, what, what to do with that information. But, um, you know, just, just having it move to the forefront of being a pillar of your health is, is the most important. What was piece. that app again? Aura Ring. It's a, it's a ring that's got sensors inside the ring. And so it measures heart rate variability, measures REM sleep, measures body temperature, REM respiratory sleep. rate. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. O U R A dot com. Yeah, it's really really fancy. That's it's it's cool. my only like favorite cool. wearable. Yeah. Yeah. When uh when you talk about the concept of sleep hygiene, do you have recommendations for your patients about you know blue screen? I find myself you know watching my favorite sporting event and falling asleep in the easy chair and finally deciding to get up and go to bed. How horrible is that, right? So what, what, what's, what does good sleep hygiene look like to you all? Dark room. Everybody tells me, yeah, my room's dark. And I, I tell them, I almost want it to be so dark you're going to trip and fall when you go to the bathroom, but really dark so that the brain knows it's time to turn off. Usually a cool room. And, and I'm, you know, I've, I've always got to push the limit. So it's, you know, the Wi-Fi router turned off, cell phone, if possible, in another room, in another story of the house. Um, yeah. Get the, get the uh, electromagnetic frequencies down as best we can. And, and as, as mentioned, just be very careful with the screen time um, as it's <laughs> so much a part of our life now. And, and, and then understand that um, a, a, a patient coming to me last week for fatigue and not really realizing that five hours is not enough sleep, yeah. you know, and, and really setting a realistic sleep schedule. Yeah. There's a little chime on your phone too. I mean, you can just set an alarm, but I love that. So every night at 9.30, my husband's, you know, chimes, but you all of a sudden go, oh my goodness, it's already 9.30. And then start dimming the lights. We have our lights all set on, they'll automatically dim. So for a good hour before we shut off our, you know, try mm -hmm. to shut off our phones and our computers and dim the lights and just in your mind, then your body, you're getting the signal to your brain that start producing melatonin and, and even the things that we eat for dinner a few hours before that can naturally produce melatonin. There's all kinds of things that people can do. Yeah, I mean, light, well, go ahead. light supper. Mm -hmm. These big meals at night are the worst thing ever. <laughs> for sleep because there's all that energy that has to do with digesting. So, so the best way is you know, eat middle of the day, big yeah. meal of the day mm -hmm. uh, is lunch and then light supper and then light activities. 
Yeah. And most of the screens that people have act, are using now have night mode on them. So th th they take out the blue light. I, I think it's mildly to, to moderately effective, mm -hmm. but I, I, every screen I have, my computer at work, my computer at home, it's constantly on night shift. So whenever I see somebody's computer screen that isn't, it just it's bright yeah. and blue and, yeah. and shocking. Yeah. Um, and I'll just, you know, I'll, my patients, you know, kind of share my computer screen, re review labs and, and studies and things. And I'll kind of show them and I'll take my night shift mode off and, and they didn't notice and all of a sudden you just, like it's just this piercing painful light. Yeah. So we have some people wear the blue blocking lenses in the evening mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. to take all that out too and that can help, especially again, people who have issues with sleep and restfulness. Um, we only have a couple minutes left in the show. I knew it was gonna go like this. Uh, quickly. Over-the-counter medications, vitamins, supplements, are, are there, uh, is there a way to tell the viewers these are okay, be careful about these, go see an expert? Is it just too individualized? It, you, you've really got to have a game plan that fits you. Okay. You know, we, I, we do a lot of lab testing, looking at zinc, vitamin C, what have you, and, and everybody is just so different in terms of what they need or what they don't. It is great to have a coach. And if you aren't sure what to take, if you don't have, have someone to guide you, then just really focus on what you're eating. Focus on the lifestyle. Put that number one. Mm -hmm. Put your money at that because you always come out ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, to Amy's point, I investing in better nutrition is much more powerful than investing in the right supplements b by far. So instead of going to find the best fish oil supplement, start sourcing wild-caught fish and get your omega-3s that way because yeah. you'll also get protein and you'll also you know put a salad next to it or you know greens that's that's a much better investment yeah. parting thoughts for our viewers tonight wow. please please decrease the sugar i think that's <laughs> number one and it's hard i love sugar but but it's it that is perhaps the number one problem please keep your legislators involved in your decisions. If they don't know how you feel about choices in, in natural medicine, nutrition, we will lose them. I think start looking at your lifestyle. I mean, the whole breathing, move, sleep pillars that we came up with, um, it's stuff we're doing every day and every choice you make can impact your health in a positive or negative way. So we have a lot of power. And mine is, you know, that every patient needs to learn to be their best advocate with their spouse, their partner, their family member. And if they're not happy with the provider they're working with and they don't feel like they're getting the right answers, don't, don't just accept that. Keep looking for, it doesn't even have to be an integrative doctor. Keep finding any doctor, any specialist to, to get answers that satisfy you because too much of healthcare is, is, is guesswork and it's quick in and out stuff. Um, John? <laughs> Lasting <laughs> words of wisdom <laughs> for our last minute. Well, one of, I, I think of one of my mentors from Vaijas, from this ancient tradition of India. He, he left uh, a consultation that we were doing by phone, and he says, the one thing I want to emphasize is to practice unconditional forgiveness. No Amen. better way to end. Amen. So thanks to our panel of guests. Dr. Amy Banter, Dr. Jeff Glad, Dr. John Peterson, and Dr. Steve Winley for joining us tonight for a great discussion on complementary and alternative medicine, and thank you for some great questions. For more information about tonight's panel and links to other videos and resources, you can visit wipb.org backslash wellness matters, and until next time, be well. All right, we're uh, live now on Facebook and YouTube. We want to uh, welcome everyone who's uh, stayed with us. Uh, the panel's got a couple more minutes, so if you have questions, uh, we'll post um, how you can get a hold of us and we can answer your question. Otherwise, thank you guys, it was a tremendous show. Uh, I learned a lot and I always like it when I learn a lot. Um, feels like we have uh, a long way to go. Um, and who better than us as family doctors? Uh, you know, our specialty was 
was founded on the concept of integrating the body and the mind and the soul. Uh, and I'm so deeply appreciative of the work each of you are doing uh, to make this life we're living better, more fulfilling, and more rich. Um, so we, uh, we have lots going on here. I want to tell everyone who's still watching, you can call us at 1-800-252-9472 or email us at WIPB at BSU.edu as well as on our Facebook live stream. So laid back now. What else? Uh, <laughs> what else should we talk about for those uh, those who are sticking with us? You know the the hardcore fans are uh, are still with us. <clears throat> We've got a question. You want to go oh, to the question? Sure. Yeah. Th th this this has already prompted us a little bit, but uh, this was probably one that came from your husband, if I'm guessing. <laughs> right. uh -oh. how, how does stress affect our health? That's a big one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's loaded. Mm -hmm. Now, we've touched on that with almost everything we've said. Yeah, so I, I love, I, I use the, the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, uh, which is the best book on the physiologic impact of, of stress. And so the, the premise is, if you, the, the zebra and, and us have the same HPA access that regulates stress in the body. Tell, tell our viewers what that is. Yeah, so the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and yep. the adrenals. So Parts of our forebrain. That's yeah. it. So Down the brain the... drives yep. cortisol, right? Cortisol, adrenaline, fight or flight response. So for the zebra, the, the most stressful event for the zebra is to be chased by a lion. Sure. And, and so that's the fight or flight response, the same response we have. While the zebra is being chased, could care less about digestion, so shut off the GI tract could care less about reproduction, so shut off the hormone, and could care less about fighting infection, so shut off the immune system. It's all escape. Yep. And so then the zebra, 15 minutes, 10 minutes escapes, resets, everything comes back into balance. And so, you know, when we run in this high stress day after day, our lions were being chased all the time. Could be finances, could be relationships, could be poor sleep, could be poor diet. Our systems do the same thing and, and shut off GI hormone immune. And you know, the, the endocrine textbooks to show you all of the widespread impact that's created on the body. I mean, it's such a great visual for yeah. thinking about, okay, what are my lions and how do I work on addressing them? Yeah. Other thoughts? So, so the, 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 the quick answer would be everything. I mean, it, it can affect everything and anything. But like Jeff said, uh, a lot of people who are in that constant fight or flight mode, they're not sleeping and or their gut's not working, the irritable bowel and, and the bloating people, and the hormones are off. Um, so they're fatigued, they're tired, they're not sleeping, and now the hormones aren't working. So it's a double whammy. So in, in gut, hormones, uh, inflammation, immune system down, that could really encompass anything. Mm -hmm. Marishi Ma always talked about um, the inward stroke in the outward stroke. And our culture is so dominated by the outward stroke. <laughs> like Jeff was saying, money, relationships, girlfriends, mm -hmm. not getting enough sleep, work, whatever it is, we get absorbed in everything out there and we lose that contact with the inward stroke. The inward stroke, which is basically that silent reservoir from which we create and, and through which we act in the world in the most positive of ways. So the, the whole, actually the whole Vedic tradition, that 5,000 tradition has to do with reestablishing the memory of wholeness, with reestablishing the inward stroke, the meditation being moment, but even the herbs, the hot water program, the, the diet, taking intelligence from the food, all of it has to do with reestablishing that memory of wholeness value so that everything that you do then becomes a spiritual practice. Inward stroke, inward stroke. Beautiful. Um, I, I think this is a really appropriate question. You guys, certainly the experts here. Could you talk more about apps and technology that you use in your practice? We've talked about the ring, a couple other apps. What other things for people who have great interest in this, where do you, where do you refer them to learn more, the lay public? You got, we, I, I got a bunch, so I'll let you guys talk first. And, and, and I mean, <laughs> it is, for, for starting with, again, through all of our pillars, we really try to, because people are constantly using their phones and technology and computers and things like that, so 
Um, we not use with the blue the background. <laughs> not be well, yes, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be able to still see it at least. Um, the mindfulness app. Um, we use that a lot to help people. Insight timer. That is what it's called. Insight timer mm. um, for meditation and breathing and helping with sleep, um, stress. So this um, is something so in the that app store is you actually look up. Insight you timer. Insight okay. timer on your phone or your computer. Yeah. That's a one that I use a lot, um, and I think you can even get it on your Apple Watch. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say the ones that come to mind, um, you know, we, I talk to patients a lot about exercise and the need to, to exercise in a way that challenges the muscles of your body. Most people think exercise is walking in the mall or taking a walk. That's activity. Th that's not exercise. Um, and so the biggest excuse, no time. Johnson & Johnson has a seven-minute workout app. Seven videos, 60 seconds long, full body work, head to toe. Everybody's got seven minutes. Uh, the Tabata timer, a four-minute routine of high-intensity training. So th those would be m two of my favorite apps to use just to kind of start to move more. I talked about the stress ones already. Um, I would say that the greatest tool that is that we're using and has the greatest potential as it gets uh, built a little bit better are the continuous glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. So we, we prescribe the Freestyle Libras a lot. So this is a, a patch that has a little monofilament, like a little fishing line, sticks on the back of your arm and you've got a reader. Well now it, it would read from your phone, minute to minute blood sugar. And so to finally get to understand what the oatmeal in the morning and the orange juice does to your blood sugar is a powerful tool to also see how your crappy night of sleep or the alcohol you drank the night before impact your blood sugar stress, how much that impacts your blood sugar. That, that's to me the most powerful tool for now and really into the future mm -hmm. is minute to minute being able to put together how this affects me. Mm -hmm. I think all of these watches too and Fitbits and all of those things, they're becoming powerful and they're even merging with I think these glucose monitors and things like that and yep. giving people feedback and information, heart rate variability. You can do right. an EKG on this thing now. Mm -hmm. You can do some pretty neat things. Yeah. Um, you, you just hit this. Maybe this will prompt us to go a little bit deeper. Can you talk about uh, how exercise fits into complementary medicine? So starting at age 40, you lose 8% of your muscle mass every decade. Oh my God. That's outrageous. <laughs> And because most people, you're nothing but proverbial <laughs> skin and bones. Are, are, aren't doing I feel like it's <laughs> and, and so it becomes so so important. And and there's so many studies connecting muscle strength and and you know most people think of well it's the bones right like bone density yeah that's important, but every aspect of health is connected to to, to holding on to strength, um, but also just watch the average person get up from a chair and get up from the floor and, and, and that, that, I mean, if they can, get if they can, the right? That's the right. thing. So it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of the pillars, right? And Movement. Flexibility, I think is a huge part of it yep. too, because we become tighter and tighter and tighter with age two. And, yeah. and if you're not intentional doing yoga or just <laughs> stretching, yeah. It's and so yoga is that, like yeah. you said, you, you want the one activity that covers as many of the pillars mm -hmm. like that's that's muscle challenge it's mind body it's stretching and flexibility it's mm -hmm. it's got it all and it's a cost saver yeah. um, you know every day it's all this is so expensive and I, I'm out of money well it, you know if, if you can do any kind of movement that gets a muscle challenge gets the stress benefit um, you know a, a seven minute app a four minute Tabata I mean those are very simple things that most most people have available yeah. at a very cost-effective price. So, yeah. one of the uh, Ayurvedic uh, principles is to take an evening walk. Mm -hmm. So, especially on a night where the stars are out, mm -hmm. so that you get not necessarily overdoing it, but so that you can relate to the rest of the universe that you are just that <laughs> but you are a small part of that yeah. and I always when I do, when I go out, I always find the pole star the nor north star yeah. 
because that has to do with human history. And it relates you to the rest of human history and our, and our past. Cool. Is, uh, I'm trying to see. I thought there was another question here, but I can't, can't quite make it out. It just out. says, can Dr. Peterson talk? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> that's what it literally he sure can. That's my, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it is. Can Dr. <laughs> Dr. Peterson talk more about his practice and how it works? I have a regular medical practice where I see everybody, all comers. And the first thing I do when I walk into the room is, first of all, I don't allow any cell phones. Um, or apps or anything. <laughs> Even the medical students are not allowed to come in with any of those things. And the first thing that I do is I take their pulse and find out what their mind-body type is and the imbalances that have been created and then to get a feeling of that wholeness value with the patient. And then I look at their history, tune it up, and then they'll get either a diltiazem, yeah. <laughs> uh, or they may get diltiazem with something else. <laughs> it's usually an integrated kind of thing, and then, and then it's done. And then on Saturdays, Vicki and I have uh, 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 purest Ayurvedic consultation services, and here's where we see out-of-town people who sometimes travel distances to see us. So we cram a whole lot into that, and we give a pure Ayurvedic a set of recommendations based on the 5,000 year principles. We're very purist about it. Mm -hmm. There's very little of us and a whole lot of Veda mm -hmm. in it. And so that, that's how it works. So it's integrated and then a purist mm -hmm. side. Steve, we've talked about your practice and, and what you do. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper. So um, I, we basically see all comers as well. Most of what we see is chronic illness at this point, chronic fatigue and irritable bowel, migraine headaches, or uh, many of the other chronic illnesses that don't fit very well in a conventional medicine box. And people are just looking for more options. What, what can we add from an integrative standpoint that can complement what they're doing or just give them uh, some, some further advantages. I always tell them, let's find things we can leverage in your favor, whatever it is. And um, so we talk about digestive health. What are they eating? Um, how's their sleep doing? We do a lot with hormone balance when applicable. Um, we'll talk about the immune system and then any nutritional deficiencies, deficits that they are lacking, uh, just not, not getting in their diet or just not absorbing. And, and then we try to find some avenue for stress uh, within our office or, or additionally to, to facilitate that as well. And, 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 and just try to meet them wherever they're at in the journey. It might be going from 10 Mountain Dews to eight. It might be, um, <laughs> you know, talking further about acupuncture, at, you know, fine tuning and already mm. very good diet, you know, just, just kind of help facilitating the process. So, I, I, you know, even during your time in the residency, I was so enthralled by your trips to UCLA to, to learn the acupuncture. What are in was a proud and certainly helpful uh, guinea pig for sure. you when you got back <laughs> and loved it and miss it. Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you have a common set or, or let me ask the question in a different way. What are the, the usual conditions where you find acupuncture in your practice to be, to be most beneficial for your patients? We, we use it uh, frequently for headaches. It, it, most people seek it out for pain and usually they've tried a variety of things before they come in for acupuncture. It's oftentimes a last resort, but it's uh, still a nice tool to complement whatever else they're doing. It's, it's wonderful for bowel issues. We, we, we don't, normally we've tried other things before that, but it, it's fantastic for digestive issues. Um, those would be the, the tops, joint, back pain, headaches, bowel issues, although it's, there, there's suggestions for basically all sorts of conditions. Amy, we had a question wanting uh, you to talk a little bit more about your practice and your online services. Hmm. Again, I have a very traditional family medicine practice. I integrate um, a lot of my integrative techniques are more just about lifestyle choices and stepping back and looking at um, a lot of my patients have come from our physical wellness center we had for the 10 years and they come in with um, 
I think the openness that they want to figure out how they can either get up a certain medicines or lower the amount of medicines or how can they lower their cholesterol naturally or everybody in my family had heart disease and I don't want to die of heart disease, what can I do? So a lot of mine is looking at their lifestyle, their dietary choices and all of that. And um, so over the years, as physicians, we're not really reimbursed that great to spend all this time that we spend in the office doing all this education. And so um, just tried to think, how can I reach more people and be more effective with my time? And so we came up with this opt to live model, which is just basically we've trained coaches who are going to be doing a lot of what I've been doing over the years on these four pillars, the breathe, eat, move, sleep. And um, so they can get online, they can do virtual visits. We have a lot of free resources online. We have podcasts. Um, so I call it rad, reliable, available, and doable, because again, I think it's overwhelming and we're trying to meet people where they are and whether they are having 10 Mountain Dews a day right. or they're really already at this optimal level and they wanna optimize it even further and do a lot of testing and, and things to get even more detailed and personalized with what nutritional deficiencies or vitamins they need. So um, it's optolive.com is what the- So we'll put that, we'll put mm -hmm. that up so everyone can find it, optolive. Mm -hmm. J Jeff, let's go a little deeper in some of the stuff you do, particularly this, uh, your nutritional background and the, your, what, what's the terminology that you use? I had it written down. The, de the deleter or the detractor. Or oh, might have been? Yeah, well, yeah, might have been. And yeah, then the, what, the other stuff that it does, looking at deficiencies, yeah. et cetera. Right. So that was a, you, you know, there was a, at a conference, I had heard one of my mentors speaking about, um, medication induced nutrient depletion and i mean just a huge database of research connecting a lot of common medications and the nutrients they deplete as you continue to take the medications and and as as she's speaking you, you know just painting the picture of of so many patients so birth control pills and, and and they deplete b vitamins which can contribute to depression like how many times have we seen now, it's not the only cause, but, yeah. but how common is it to see that? The diabetic who takes metformin and it depletes B12 and B12 deficiency causes neuropathy. Well, how many of these people, is it diabetic neuropathy right. or, or is it my medication-induced neuropathy? Yep. So I, I just took all of that data and, and turned it into a calculator that can be easily used online. Um, you type in the name of the drug or the, the list of drugs you're on, you hit calculate, and it just pulls the database of the nutrients potentially being depleted. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, you know, you know, it was a labor of love for a long time where I used it at the bedside, lots of other practitioners used it. And, and what a great way to start your relationship with a patient is just to take their medication list and say, L look how many of the symptoms of deficiency yeah. you just told me yeah. about. It, could it be that easy? Sometimes yeah. it is, yeah. you know, well now let's look at these, let, let's look at these blood levels or let's simply just take a, a reasonably priced supplement mm -hmm. to, to, to offset that. And then let's figure out what the root issues are that got you to the medicine and help you get off of that. So we are uh, at the spot where I'm gonna say, any other topics we haven't talked about you think are important for our viewers to understand about complementary and alternative medicine? I'd like to throw one out. It's a little bit off from where we've been tonight, but one of the biggest issues I've seen this year for the first 10 months has been the upsurge in identification of mold and mold illness. And I, I just, it's, it's not something that, that really targets the rest of the talk, so I hate to bring it up, but it has just been so frequent in practice in terms of fatigue and illness and, and problems head to toe. I just wanted to throw that out there for people who are battling chronic illness. Keep, please keep mold in mind. Climate change? <laughs> Indiana. I, I'm not Indiana. sure. Uh, Water damage it buildings. Is, and, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Old buildings that are kind of hitting their lifespan right. and, and, right. uh, and, and how things are built these days, I'm not sure. But it is uh, it has gotten from almost monthly to weekly uh, driving people into the office. How, do you, how are you helping diagnose that? The, it, a, a lot of times it's, it's people who are chronically sick, getting sicker and not getting better with 
other means. And uh, it, it may, you may have to ask somebody three, four, I, I had to ask people for months, are you sure you don't have mold in your house, in your basement, in your crawl space, in your bathroom, in your workplace? And for some people it was a no, 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 oh, we found it and it's bad, you know. And, and then they, they start not only the remediation of their house, but the remediation of, of what it's been doing to them. And so it's, it's becoming so frequent, I just want to throw that out. Anything else? Uh, I, I mean, a, a hot topic that I always get when I speak is 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 detox. Yeah. Right. Everyone okay. wants what's what's the best detox program and right. protocol and what, I, I what, mean, what's the next high colonic, right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, well, I mean, for me, mo most of that is like depending on who's advertising. Yeah. It, it's product. Yeah. Like like people are just selling product, and and to me, the principle is stop toxing. Yeah. Right. It's it's like this mold thing. Well, yeah. you know, do do you need a really fancy testing and treatment for mold or, or do we just need to remove you from the exposure mm -hmm. either through remediation or considering other other means you know do, do you smoke you know sugar yeah. uh, you know the, the, what you put on your skin yeah. you, you know mm -hmm. these things are all toxins and if you lessen the toxin load that that's your best pathway to detox beautiful okay well thanks to everyone who stayed with us on Facebook and again, you can I find have one more thing. Oh, John, Lynn, let's go, <laughs> buddy. There's no time limit. I just wanted to uh, give my appreciation to you guys. I mean, it's just it's, it's so heartwarming <laughs> to, to see people with this deeper interest in health. And a uh, big thanks to Jeff, who has always been such That's a so great good. contributor to education and to the community. You know, we really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate all that you done for me and being able to share share the times that we have together it's uh, certainly an uplifting thing for us all so again thanks to everyone who stayed with us on facebook and again you can find more resources at wipb.org backslash wellness matters and thanks again to our panel and uh, i think we'll we'll call it a night thank you all so much Fantastic.